Great, so I think we're live, so we should be recording. Oh, there we go. Welcome everyone to today's talk. So today we're going to do a talk on vascular surgery, so hopefully cover all the main presentations that will be useful for your finals exams. Um, just a quick introduction, my name's Kirsten, I'm an academic FY1 at St George's Hospital and I'm currently rotating in vascular surgery. Um, so before we get started, we've got a quick message from um, BMA. So um, Daniel is here to tell us a bit more about what the BMA can offer you as medical students and soon to be FY1s. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I, will, I will be as quick as possible. Um, just a bit of an update on <coughs> sort of things that are going on at the moment. <coughs> Should be able to see my screen now. Um, so first things first. Um, yeah, important year to, to be uh, members, especially final years coming into F1. Um, so if you're not already a member, um, a bit of a, a bit of a incentive to join. Um, if you join today using that QR code or link I put in the chat, you'll get a £10 Amazon voucher. Membership's £3.75 a month, so it's like it covers three months free, basically. This isn't on our website. This isn't You won't find this anywhere else, so this is just exclusive to anyone watching um, live or watching this back. Um, all you need to do is, after you've joined, drop me a quick uh, email, um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get a voucher sent out to you. So, yeah, best, best deal around, to be honest. Uh, we don't really run um, things like this. Um, in the mainstream, so yeah, make take advantage of it if you're not already a member. Um, so yeah, so I'm from the BMA, um, sort of work on the membership side of things in in London. Um, I'm I'm out and about most days um, across trust hospitals, um, a lot of organising strikes and whatnot at the moment. Um, so yeah, I'm sure every, everybody knows um, what what the BMA does. Um, so, you know, sometimes you get a bit of confusion with with companies like. MDU and MPS, um, who are indemnity companies. Um, we're obviously your union, so we <coughs> we cover sort of the non-clinical side of things. So uh, for better or for worse, we negotiate the pay for all doctors uh, in, in, in the NHS. Um, there's, there's three ways really to think about what we do. Um, on an individual basis, so so if you if you have any issues with contracts, whatever, or or, or sort of one to one uh, at work or in or med school, um, and then on a local level, so when you are in trusts um, or even at university, if there's there's an issue going on for sort of a group of you, um, we come in and we sort of know um, who to talk to and how to how to sort of sort things out, and then obviously on a on a national level, as you're seeing at the moment, we we negotiate and, and you know we put put everyone together. Um, so yeah, so we've currently got 191,000 members who have made up of doctors and med students. Um, and yeah, it's worth just remembering that the BMA is exclusively for uh, doctors and med students. So we don't we don't have anyone else in the NHS uh, in, in, in membership. It's just it's just for you guys. So it's a very specific um, type of membership. So yeah, just a quick update on what's going on at the moment. Um, we are just beginning our reballot for junior doctors. Um, so our mandate comes, our, this is our second mandate, our second six months, it comes to an end in March. So what we did last time was we had a reballot um, as it was coming to an end. So there's a seamless transition. Um, so yeah, so we will, we will be <coughs> um, going around all the juniors again, make sure they've, they've voted and, and, and keeping up the, the pressure. Um, no strikes announced for juniors at the moment, uh, but it's usually around this time where things get announced. There will be, um, I, I imagine there will be strikes in, in Feb, um, so probably towards the end of Feb at this point. Um, we were sort of waiting on what was going to happen with the consultants' offer. So, so the consultants were given an offer by the government. We put it out to membership to vote on. <coughs> Um, sorry, and last week we got the we got the response on the vote uh, response from the consultants who voted against the offer. So the consultants are going back on strike because we have a mandate to strike for the consultants. So that's that would have informed a lot if the consultants had voted for that. It would have maybe paved the way to, for an end to this. But but they they voted against the offer they were given. I won't go into the details of the offer because it's quite complex. Um, but yeah, it's quite tight. Fifty one percent voted against the offer. Um, so it was, it was very very tight in the end. Um, but yeah, we we the consultants will go back on on strike now. Okay, just a few other little things, and then and I'll let you get on. So BMA Library, if you're a member, you get access to thousands of textbooks and, and journals. Um, we used to have BMA House uh, services, so you could go there in person if you're in London, or or we'd send the books out to you. But now everything you can access um, instantly through um, through the through our website. Um, everything you could possibly need is on there. BMJ Learning as well. I'm sure you got access to BMJ Learning through uni anyway. Um, but yeah, but obviously when that comes to an end, you'll have full access to BM, 
jade learning through through your BMA membership um, in F1. Um, so yeah, do use that for for things like passing exams and, and revision tools. Um, clinical key. So this is essentially a point of care tool. Um, we've bought this uh, this bought this product. Um, it's not ours, but but you get access to it through your BMA membership. Um, so yeah, essentially a point of care tool. Um, type in any condition, it'll bring up every single <laughs> journal, book, <laughs> um, video um, to, to to sort of go go through that condition with you. Um, BMJ. So the actual, so now you're in your final year, you're actually entitled to get in the BMJ um, every week. So as part of that three pounds seventy five a month, you get four copies a month, roughly. You know, so every every Saturday I get mine. Um, so yeah, so even that alone works out as paying less than a pound for every BMJ you get through the post. So the thing is, with that you need to uh, opt into that. So if you're already a member and you're not getting it, you just need to give us a call because it's an opt-in service um, rather than everyone getting it. Um, and anyone who joins today, um, you, you'd be letting into that little secret. So as soon as you join, um, just drop us an email and we'll, we'll get that sent to you every week. Um, we've got a great um, well-being support service, so that's open to everybody 24/7. Um, and and it, the the unique thing about this is we've got a the choice of you speak to a counsellor or a peer support doctor, so somebody who's been through um, similar similar situations to you. Um, a bit early to be thinking about this, maybe. Um, but we've got a specialty explorer tool. Um, essentially, it's a psychometric test. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to 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 do. <coughs> It'll ask all sorts of work-life balance questions, and then at the end, it'll break down all the top suit specialties according to the answers you've given. Um, really good to do it sort of now, and then sort of when you start off, and just see how how your sort of tastes change and your answers change. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to making your choice, especially years to come, um, you, you've sort of been informed quite early on by by doing this, um, amongst other things. Um, so yeah, it's it's very important that. Um, you guys coming into F1 because it will come around very quickly. Uh, our membership and, and, and we're strong in, in that regard. Um, yeah, so so do join um, and, and do get involved as much as you can um, ahead of time um, because yeah, it, it, chances are it's going to roll around to, to when you guys are there. Um, so yeah, we just want everyone to be um, <laughs> is in this fight together as, as uh, the jun- the current juniors are. Um, that's it. I will stop sharing. Um, yeah, and I'll, and I'll hand you back to Kirsten and let you crack on with the session. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel, for coming and sharing that with us. Um, obviously, it's very relevant at this moment in time, still very much in the heat of everything for not just junior doctors, but consultants too. Um, great. So I'm just going to share the slides. Um, just let me know in the comments when you can see it. So I'm hoping for this session to be as interactive as possible. Um, I've tried to condense all the key information for finals into um, the slides to make it as high yield as possible. So the stuff that comes up um, year on year. And then we'll talk through some cases just before I tell you about the condition, just so we can cast our wide um, thinking caps widely because obviously in your MCQ exam it won't be flagged as a vascular surgery question so it's important to consider other differentials as well and um, so it should start to help you get thinking and then towards the end of the presentation we'll also just cover how to do an arterial and venous exam which should be helpful for your OSCEs too and um, so any questions throughout the presentation just um pop them in the comments below and I'll try my best to answer them as soon as we get a lot and um, go along. Um, just while we're waiting for this to load, just to let you know, I'm also part of Mind the Bleep and help run the final year content. And we're currently in the process of running and um, putting together an online interactive OSCE series. Um, so as always, all our events will be advertised on Medal. So if you're interested in um, developing your OSCE technique and running through cases of the most common OSCE exams. They will be coming up in the next few weeks as well. Great, so let's get started. So yeah, as I said, I'm an F1 doctor at St. George's and I'm currently on vascular surgery. And the slides have been kindly reviewed by my supervising consultant, Mr. Desai. So this is what we're gonna cover today. Um, hopefully, um, a good range of conditions. So we'll start off by what comes up most commonly, so lower extremity arterial disease, also known as peripheral vascular disease, um, acute limb ischemia, compartment syndrome, which is a key one not to miss, 
um, crotostenosis, and then we'll touch on venous disease and aortic disease as well. Um, so this is your MLA curriculum. So we'll try to cover as many of the more vascular related pathologies here as possible as we go along, but just so you're aware and you have this for reference. So the first um, topic I want to talk about is low extremity arterial disease. So can anyone put in the chat, name any risk factors that you know of that puts you at risk of de developing arterial disease in your legs? Smoking, good. Diabetes, well done. So yeah, good, those are two of the really big risk factors that we see a lot of our vascular paths on the vascular ward having um, a diagnosis of either diabetes or smoking. Absolutely hyperlipidemia, that's really good. So there are three main patterns of arterial disease that you get in your legs. So intermittent claudication, chronic limb threatening ischemia, um, and acute limb ischemia. So we'll just go through each of them. And it's really important that you have it clear in your mind how these three are different um, in terms of exams. And then for risk factors, the main one to think about is atherosclerosis. So just fatty plaques in the walls of your artery. And that makes sense because it narrows um, the lumen of your artery affecting arterial supply. Um, so yeah, hyperlipidemia contributes towards that, of course. Um, and then I like to break the risk factor down into modifiable and non-modifiable. And this also helps um, you in terms of thinking about management on how, to, how we can change some of these um, modifiable factors. So smoking, obesity and hypertension and hyperlipidemia, these all put you at higher risk of developing arterial disease. And then risk factors that you can't control, and you can't modify in patients are their age, um, males are more prone to it than females, and personal history or family history of cardiovascular events. Um, so yeah, these are your risk factors for lower extremity arterial disease. So the first component that I want to talk about is intermittent claudication. So I have a case excerpt. So a 57 year old man has been seeing his GP for the past four years of recurrent leg pain. The patient reports that the calf pain has recently gotten worse and he can only walk about 100 yards before the pain starts again. This means he has put on weight because he can't do as much exercise but he says he doesn't have any pain when he's at rest um, and doesn't have pain anywhere else, just in the calf. So given this presentation of very reproducible calf pain, what do we think this patient might be suffering from? So what are your causes of calf pain? Probably arterial occlusion. Yep, that's a good idea. Any other ideas? Thinking not just vascular surgery, any causes of calf pain that you can think of? DVT, absolutely. Intermittent claudication, anything else? Cellulitis, good. So um, well done everyone. Thank you for those who are contributing to the chat. This is really good to think beyond just vascular um, pathology. So yeah, in this case, this is a typical int intermittent claudication um, picture, but you can have other causes of calf pain too. So one thing that's really important to differentiate from vascular claudication is neurogenic claudication. Um, so you do get this kind of cramp-like pain on exertion that resolves within a few minutes and nothing at rest. And this is really typical of a vascular um, type picture because when you exert yourself, there's increased demand 
in the leg. And so you develop the pain after a fixed amount of exertion. So patients are very specific in terms of their walking distance that they can tell you about. And the key part is that it's not at rest. So that's really good. Whereas neurogenic claudication is slightly different. Um, instead of being triggered by exercise, it can be triggered by kind of positional um, movements. So like lumbar extension um, is worse and it's better in lumbar flexion and pain can come with very minimal exertion, unlike vascular claudication where pain comes after lots of ex exertion. Um, so yeah, just something to think about is that you can get these kind of localized pains in your limbs as well from nerves. Um, so just to think, is it vascular or is it neurogenic? And then, yeah, other types of calf pain, if it was just a single event, I'd be thinking DVT. And if it was also unilateral, so intermittent claudication can be unilateral or bilateral, depending on the arterial disease in both legs, how bad each one is. Um, but DVT is pretty much always unilateral. And you wouldn't have a, such a long history of, say, four years. It'd probably be a more acute picture. And yeah, cellulitis, absolutely, again, would definitely be unilateral and would be accompanied by skin changes, um, as well as kind of tender skin rather than tender muscle, which you see in DVT, for example. And then you wouldn't see tender muscle in intermittent claudication. Um, so this slide depicts, depending on where the occlusion is in your artery, where you might develop pain, just because of where that particular artery supplies. So when it comes to MCQ questions, really pay attention to where the ischemia is presenting in the patient, because that will tell you where your obstruction is. So most commonly, you'll see obstructions in your femoral artery, which is your thigh and your calf pain, popliteal artery as well, calf and ankle. And then the one they like to say in MCQs is buttock and hip pain, which tells you it's the iliac artery and that's been blocked. It's just one of those MCQ facts that's really useful to know. So once we know someone has intermittent claudication, how do we investigate them? So what we want to do is assess all the lower limb pulses. So find out um, doing an arterial exam, just having a feel for the pulses at each level, um, because that will help to tell you if, where the blockage might be. And if you can't feel it, you can use a handheld Doppler at the bedside as well. Um, another thing you can do is an ankle brachial index. Um, so this is your ankle systolic pressure divided by your brachial systolic pressure. And if you have a value of less than 0.9, that shows that you've got claudication. And then the lower the value, the more severe your arterial disease is. So, for example, when you get to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, then you start to develop rest pain and that kind of progresses into chronic limb threatening ischemia. If you have an ABPI of over one, that means your um, vessels are very hardened, which um, is a result of calcification secondary to diabetes. So it's just a useful fact to know as well. And um, the ABPI can really be helpful in terms of severity of arterial disease. Um, also want to do an ECG. Um, again, look for any kind of heart conditions that might. So a lot of people confuse intermittent claudication with acute limb ischemia, um, which we'll touch on in a bit, but again, just kind of screening your basic medical workup for patients. And you wanna do blood tests. So full blood count, use knees, do your lipids to look for your risk factor to see if that's something you can medically manage. And then send off inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP for vasculitis, and also to look for any um, deranged clotting. But the most key part of um, arterial disease is using a duplex ultrasound. So does anyone know what duplex means? Why is it called duplex ultrasound? So we've got a question saying, please can you remind me of what an ABPI is and can tell you to distinguish venous from arterial and mixed 
etiologies. So ABPI just tells you about arterial disease because it's looking at your ankle systolic pressure um, divided by your brachial systolic pressure. So what you do is you put a um, you put a blood pressure cuff on your ankle and you put a blood pressure cuff around your brachial artery just normally and then you take those two values and divide one by the other and then um so you want to divide ankle divided by your brachial and that just tells you the level of arterial disease so for example it should be one because there should be the same amount of arterial flow going from your arm to your leg but the lower that um, number is the poorer your arterial flow is and if you have it higher that means there's kind of propagation of arterial flow and it's because your vessels are really hardened in the arteries um, so it's a sign of calcification. So does anyone want to contribute what they think duplex might mean? So it's a very common term that we hear about in vascular surgery but what does it actually mean? Don't worry if you guys don't know. So duplex is, I think of it as kind of two. Um, so sorry, there's a question saying, does it matter which hands break your pressure to use in case both hands have different systolic pressures? Um, so theoretically in a healthy patient, you should have the same syst uh, brachial systolic pressure in both arms. Um, if you don't, that's kind of a sign of a different pathology, which we'll talk about later. Um, so yeah, you should have the same pressure in both arms. Otherwise that's a sign you might be having an aortic dissection. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter which hand you use in that case. So going back to a duplex. So duplex um, means there's two modes or two elements to it. So the Doppler is just your ultrasound image that measures blood flow. So as you can see in the picture here, and then your B mode obtains an image of the vessel itself. So this is really useful. You can duplex arteries, you can duplex veins in your arms and legs, you can duplex your aorta. Um, it's a really useful tool that we use every single day on the vascular ward. And it can tell you about um, the size of the vessel and also the type of flow. So you have triphasic flow, biphasic flow, and monophasic flow. Does anyone know what triphasic flow means? So triphasic flow is a sign of a really healthy artery because it means that you have three elements and phases to your arterial flow. So the peak um, that comes rapidly is your kind of antegrade forwards flow that peaks during systole. And then you have a transient reversal of the flow during early diastole. So this is just, if you imagine a blood flowing through an artery, it's stretching and then kind of closing again. Um, and then the last part is this kind of slow forwards flow um, during late diastole. And that just means there's good elasticity in your peripheral arteries, and this is considered normal. Whereas monophasic flow, um, which you can hear on a Doppler, it just sounds like one consistent sound, um, is a sign of an abnormal artery. So the duplex is really good at telling you um, size of the vessel, the flow, and yeah, the characteristic, the character of the flow, which is just something important to know. Um, good. And then how do we manage intermittent claudication? So thinking back to our modifiable risk factors, so we can encourage patients to stop smoking um, and to exercise and to lose weight. And we can also stop people from preventing minor trauma. So what often happens is that um, in lower extremity arterial disease, people will get um, like stub their toe and because they've got poor arterial supply, they don't heal very well and ulcers can progress um, as a result of minor trauma. So good foot care is really important. And then going back to our risk factors as well, how can we optimize their risk factors with best medical management? We can start patients on an antiplatelet therapy, so clopidogrel, 75 milligrams, 
um, don't worry too much about the doses, and can also lower their lipids with a statin. So atorvastatin is really commonly used. Making sure they have good um, blood pressure control to take away that hypertension risk factor and that they have good diabetic control. So looking at their diabetes. So does anyone know how we can assess whether someone's diabetes is well controlled or not? HbA1c, exactly. This is a blood test that tells us over a longer period of time because it's all based on the lifespan of the red blood cells and how um, sugars get attached to them, so glycosylated hemoglobin. Um, then, yeah, that gives us a kind of three month window of how kind of up and down someone's blood sugar control has been. Um, Mariam asks, is it clopidogrel or aspirin the preferred one? Um, I think it depends on your trust, depends on um, each hospital, but any kind of single antitherapy would be useful. So yeah, either aspirin or clopidogrel. Um, great, so moving on to chronic limb threatening ischemia. Um, so this is slightly different. Um, some, you might come across this as CLI, so critical limb ischemia, but the new terminology is chronic limb threatening ischemia. So there are three main features to look out for. If you see two or th two of th these three features, you can be pretty confident that this is CLTI. So look for these buzzwords in your MCQs. Um, so rest pain, um, night, so pain when you're not doing anything, pain at night um, and tissue loss. So ulceration or gangrene. So this is the bulk of what we see on the vascular ward. So what do we do with patients like this? We admit them, we do the same investigations as intermittent claudication, because um, it's kind of an earlier part of that spectrum. And then we think about how we can treat this ischemia. So it's a chronic pathology, there's nothing acute and urgent. So we wanna admit the patient, do some investigations and imaging to find out at which level they've got blockages, how good their arteries look and then think about what's best for them. So do we revascularize them to help open up some of those blocked arteries? Or is the tissue loss too great? Do we have to amputate? To, um, is the tissue non-salvageable? And then again, thinking about antiplatelet and statin therapy after. Um, so someone's asked, when would you not give a patient TED stockings to prevent a DBT? Um, so if someone has venous disease, so we'll cover this later, you don't want to give them compression stockings if they also have arterial disease, because if someone has arterial disease and you give them compression stockings, it's going to make their pathology worse. So whenever you consider giving compression stockings to someone with venous disease, always do an ABPI to look for any signs of arterial disease before you proceed with compression, just so you don't risk making that pathology worse. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what revascularizing actually is. So um, you can use either an endovascular approach. So um, kind of you go through, kind of like keyhole, you go through like arterial access, um, or you can do it by surgery, so more open surgery. So what's really common in interventional radiology is to use a balloon angioplasty plus or minus a stent. This can be done either under local anaesthetic or general anaesthetic. But as the diagram shows, you put in a catheter and then you inflate a balloon to expand the narrowed artery. And then you can also add a stent to help hold the artery, um, artery open for a longer period of time. So this is really useful when you've got um, a big vessel and you've got a small area of occlusion. Whereas if you've got a long area of occlusion or multiple different small areas along the same artery, then a bypass is better. So what you do is you take one of the patient's own veins, so usually their long saphenous vein, or you can use synthetic material. Um, and you can use uh, the vein to bypass the blocked area of artery. So the vein will carry arterial blood in the new channel. Obviously, it requires good flow above and below the occlusion. Otherwise, it won't work. Um, 
obviously both of these come with um, complications. So for an endovascular approach, um, you can get um, like embolic events that happen um, where you've gone in with the uh, balloon and stent. You can have vessel dissection, pseudoaneurysm, where the layers of the vessel wall kind of balloon and form an aneurysm. And because of how it's done, um, lots of contrast is used um, to help visualize the vessels during the procedure. Um, because it's not open, then you are at risk of renal failure from all that contrast you're using. And then with the surgical bypass, the risk is that um, it might not work. You might get emboli further down, the graft itself might thrombose, you might get what's called reactive hyperemia, so like kind of reperfusion injuries, um, and you might have to change, um, revise the graft if the healing fails. So it's not always 100% successful. Um, so you have to take into consideration these risks. And then also just thinking about the patient's general fitness for surgery, if they can tolerate an open surgery, it's more time on the table. Um, so you need kind of a fitter baseline. Um, so just going back to reactive hyperemia, this is when you have like a local vasodilation, um, which occurs when there's been an interruption to blood flow and there hasn't been good oxygen supply. Um, then you get kind of this reactive response once you increase blood flow to an area after a period of occlusion. So just something to think about, just a common complication. Um, someone says, hi there, will slides and recording be made available? Will the feedback form be posted in the chat here? Thanks. Yes, so there'll be a QR code at the end of this session that um, you can give feedback on, which will be really useful for us as we keep developing our series. And please tell us if there's anything you'd like from our upcoming OSCE series. Um, and yes, slides and um, recordings should be made available on medal and there's a bit of a delay on the youtube because of just some technical difficulties but we are trying to upload all of them okay so that thinking about revascularization but sometimes we can always think about amputations so this is where um the tissue loss is not salvageable we can't just revascularize and hope that helps heal the tissue um so we obviously aim to take off uh, as least as possible with amputation. So um, if it's just toes, you can give toe, just chop people's toes off and um, to help save the rest of their foot. Um, or you can do what's known as a trans metatarsal amputation. So I put in a picture just to help visualize what this is because it's quite a mouthful, but you go across your metatarsals um, and you cut along there. Um, if the whole kind of forefoot is not salvageable. And then you kind of move up depending on how severe um, the infection is. But the whole idea of amputation is kind of, um, you want to cut away the infected tissue or ischemic tissue because they start to release toxins and they start to spread further up. So it's kind of life-saving surgery and it needs to be done sometimes in an emergency. So you can do what's called a guillotine amputation. So you just cut straight across and then you go back a few days later once they're more stable. Um, and yeah, once they're more stable and then you can kind of close it properly with a skin flap or kind of amputate higher up. So chronic limb threatening ischemia is often the first sign of end-stage vascular disease. Um, so the Surgical options in these patients in the vascular pass usually have a high mortality because it's kind of a sign of end stage disease. Um, so that's why the outcomes are not necessarily amazing with vascular patients because it's already a sign of quite severe disease. But if people do heal well from an amputation, there is potential for rehabilitation afterwards. Great. Oops. So we're going to move on to talk about acute limb ischemia. But before I do, I wanted to ask you guys if you knew how an acute limb ischemia presents, because this is something that should be that comes up year on year 
the six P's of acute limb ischemia. Can anyone tell me what those six P's are? Cool, so pale, pain, pulseless, paresthesia, perishingly cold, paralysis. Good, I think we've got all of them between us, so well done. Um, obviously been revising very well, because this is what helps distinguish what acute limb ischemia is versus other types of arterial um, pathology. So in the name, it's acute, it happens very quickly, and this can be caused either by a thrombus in a vascular path or an embolus with someone with risk factors. Like for example, they might have uh, atrial fibrillation or they might have infective endocarditis. And there's lots of other causes too, but those are your two main ones, thrombus and embolus. Um, so basically, if you just think about, there's like a sudden blockage to arterial flow, how does that affect the limb? So it's painful, it's pale, it's cold, you can't, you might not be able to feel the pulses. And then you might have some kind of damage to muscles and nerves. So thinking about loss of power or paralysis and paresthesia. So this is an emergency surgically because you want to try and take away what's causing the blockage immediately before you lose all blood supply to your limb. Um, so key investigations would be to do a CT angiogram. So it's a CT that uses contrast to look at um, your blood vessels. So an angiogram takes a picture of your blood vessels. And then you want to prepare these patients straight for theatre. So keep them nailed by mouth and aim to reperfuse within less than six hours if possible. Um, so this is just something to be aware of. You don't need to um, memorize all the details, but this is the Rutherford acute limb ischemia classification and it basically just tells you if um, a limb is salvageable or not. Um, so when you get to stage three and um, these patients have a non-salvageable salvageable limb so they have pretty much profound nerve sensory loss, they're paralyzed, can't hear any arterial Doppler signals and so that's the key thing. Um, Okay, and then depending on how severe or how viable the tissue is, changes how we treat it. So if it is viable, then we give a dose of heparin to try to break down any clots. And if it's embolic, then we can consider a surgical um, thrombectomy. So that's just using a surgical approach to take out the embolus. Or if it's thrombotic, then we can use medicine to, thromb to thrombolize it. So um, giving medication to help break down the thrombus. And then afterwards, we can think about opening up the arteries with an endarterectomy or so kind of clearing out some of that atherosclerotic plaque or using a balloon and bypass. And again, we talked about perfusion injury um, when muscles can swell if they've not had um, blood supply to them. And then when you reintroduce blood supply, they might swell further. Um, so you want to use a fasciotomy. So making incisions down your lower leg to try and reduce compartment syndrome, which we'll touch on in a bit. If the tissue is non-viable, then actually the reperfusion injury risk is too great. Um, you don't want to cause, um, you, it can result in death and mortality if you kind of reperfuse a dead limb. So signs are that there's rigid limbs, they're very immobile, they might have a mottled purple colour. And the option here is to go for an amputation. Again, removing as little tissue as possible. Obviously, this is a major surgery, so we need to consider functional impact and the pre-morbid status of patients. Um, and it might, make, might require revision if it doesn't heal well the first time. Great, so next we'll talk about compartment syndrome. So again, I've got another case for you just find it. So 
compartment syndrome. So a 37 year old man um, develops this develops a condition where he his mild thigh swells and starts to ache. Um, there's Mars tenderness and the pain developed one hour after sustaining a rugby injury to his right lower thigh. He got a blow to his um, right anterior lower thigh and then he was admitted to hospital after. So if someone's had an injury to their leg and they've got kind of mild swelling and pain afterwards, what are some of our differentials? Might have given it away already, but thinking not just what we've talked about, what else could be the cause? Fracture, good. Soft tissue injury, hematoma, yeah. So all your kind of classic orthopedic things. Great, so obviously what we're getting at in a vascular surgery talk is compartment syndrome, but it's really important to think about other things because often this can present in the context of trauma and fractures. So the, uh, the swelling and the pain might just be from the injury itself. So just inflammation around the area, is there a fracture, is there um, bruising, muscle damage, is there a collection of blood, so hematoma underneath. But the key, thing to think about with compartment syndrome is that the pain is out of proportion to the injury. So it's an extreme level of pain to the patient and the pain gets worse when you stretch their limbs passively. And visually the compartment looks very tense because of all that pressure inside. Um, so it's defined as raised pressure within a closed compartment resulting in tissue ischemia. And if it's left untreated, it can cause um, death of the tissue because you don't have good supply when the pressure is so great and start affecting the um, blood vessels. It has a very wide range of causes. So always have a low threshold of as low suspicion of compartment syndrome. And how do we manage this? So the definitive management is um, decompressing the pressure with fa fasciotomy um, and then giving IVF fluids to prevent renal failure because um, if there's some muscle death like rhabdomyolysis um, you might have renal injury from all the kind of dead muscle protein that it's trying to clear. Um, so yeah compartment syndrome is something that we should try and not miss at all um, because um, yeah it can cause a very quick death of a muscle group within four to six hours um, so yeah, but what happens in compartment pressure is that the pressure in the leg compartment is greater than the perfusion pressure. And so you get ischemia, dead tissue, and then your myoglobin circulates into your urine and then you get renal failure as well. Um, so yeah, there's a technical diagnostic definition where you need a compartment pressure with an absolute value of 30 to 45. Um, mercury mmhg um so you can measure the compartment pressure but it's not um essential to the diagnosis uh, millimeters mercury is what i meant to say <laughs> the mmhg unit um good so fasciotomy is where you just make incisions into the fascia and that just helps release um, the pressure inside your deep posterior compartment and often you can use two incisions along your lower limb. Great, so I'm going to move on to talking about venous disease now, um, just to touch upon this. So when people have issues with um, their veins, so there's not good flow back up through the veins, um, they can either have insufficiency in the superficial system or the deep system. So thinking about the anatomy of um, the veins. And a DVT is your most common deep um, T 
deep venous system disease and um, varicose veins are your most common superficial um, venous insufficiencies. Um, other signs of venous disease is um, just think about um, congestion in your lower limbs. So you might get edema. Um, you also get deposition of hemosiderin. So you might get pigment brown pigmentation in the skin. You might get some venous eczema, venous ulcers, particularly in the gator region, so the lower shin kind of area. Um, you might also get lipodermato, lipodermatosclerosis, so um, the classic like inverted champagne bottle shape. Um, and this is due to inflammation and fibrosis of subcutaneous tissue. And you also obviously get varicose veins, which are clusters and um, dilated clusters of veins um, that you can see on the surface. Um, so this is a picture of varicose veins. Um, they're more common in females. The primary cause is due to valve insufficiency in the superficial valves and secondary can be after a DVT, so it affects your general venous system. Or if you have increased pelvic pressure, then that causes congestion. Um, or again, trauma can affect the venous system. And how this presents is someone will complain of painful legs, heavy legs or itchy legs. So areas where there is varicosities, they might experience some itch. And usually it's just cosmetic and you'd only kind of think about intervening if there's complications such as bleeding from the varicose vein or thrombophlebitis, so a non-infective inflammatory process around the cluster of veins. Otherwise, you can just encourage people to elevate their legs or um, wear compression stockings, but as I said, the, which will help return venous flow, but make sure to check there's no arterial disease with a simple ABPI test. Um, two ways, two main ways to manage varicose veins is using ultrasound. You can pass down a guide wire and either use radio frequency or heat to kind of ablate parts of the vein or close it off using um, injecting foam that reacts with the vein. So that closes off the dilated section or you can use a surgical approach so you can strip the varicose veins um, so it really just depends I think most commonly we like to use a minimally invasive approach um, just because often the complications of varicose veins aren't too severe so going for surgery you've got to balance the risk um, but yeah you can strip from the long saphenous vein to below the knee. Um, the short saphenous vein is not usually stripped because there's a risk of injury to the nerve. It's very close to the common perineal nerve. The risk of stripping um, veins is that it might re reoccur. Um, you might get some bruising and bleeding at the site, infection, DVT, um, again, nerve damage, as we said, and some skin discoloration from the intervention. Okay, so the next the next um, thing I want to talk about is carotid disease. So who can we expect to see carotid disease in? What patient groups or what have patients might have had if we later find out they have carotid disease? Because usually people don't present or patients don't say I have carotid disease they say that they've experienced something which then they later realize they had carotid disease does anyone know good a stroke or a TIA um so because the carotid supplies the brain um uh stenosis of the carotid artery usually manifests as a TIA or a stroke and 10 to 15 percent of ischemic strokes and TIAs um originate from carotid stenosis and another classic picture is um, transient ipsilateral blindness. So a patient will describe just curtains coming down on their vision. This is when a small embolus just lodges in the retinal artery and then it self-resolves. So this is athlos usually an atherosclerotic process at the bifurcation of the common carotid, which you can see in the picture. Um, how do we investigate this? We can use an ultrasound test to look for the level of stenosis, how thick the plaque is in there. Um, or we can use imaging, so using CT or MRI and geography imaging with contrast. How do we manage this? We often start dual antiplatelet therapy. 
And then surgically, what we can do is make an incision along the artery and then remove the diseased intima, kind of physically remove it. And then you can also add a shunt if you want to keep it open to continue blood flow. But this is only indicated in patients with a high degree of stenosis. So through imaging, we can see that if there's over 70% um, stenosis in your carotids, then we should intervene. So this is another um, MCQ nugget that comes up quite often. Um, it's like how much percentage of stenosis would you need to consider surgical intervention? And that's 70%. Great. Any questions so far? Maybe we've covered quite a lot. If not, I'm just going to finish talking about a few aortic diseases. So, um, got another case for you. So, a 75 year old female presents to a hospital with a headache and left leg pain, which radiates to her lower back. On the morning of the pain developing, she had some right foot numbness and multiple falls. What do we think might be causing all this pain in the back, pain in the leg, numb foot and falling and headache? What are your differentials? Yep, aortic dissection, that's your main one. Can anyone think of any other differentials based on that presentation? So we've got leg pain and back pain, mainly. Triple A, yeah, it's a good, a good suggestion. Triple A rupture. Great. So yeah, this is quite an obvious aortic dissection presentation or spinal cord injury. That's a really good one. Um, so then if you think about some of your neurological, um, so neuropathic pain and loss of sensation with your paresthesia. Um, but yeah, good. So the main thing here is an aortic dissection. If it was an triple A rupture, you'd think the patient would be more hemodynamically unstable. Um, so they would have more significant collapses and loss of consciousness rather than just a headache and a fall. But absolutely, abdo and back pain is another sign of an aortic aneurysm rupture. But yeah, aortic dissection is your main differential, so well done. Um, just slides. Great. So aortic dissection is defined as a tear in the tunica intima of your blood vessel and blood dissects and forms a false lumen um, next to the actual lum true lumen of the vessel. So you can see it on imaging. So a CT angiogram would be your definitive type of injuring, imaging, sorry, um, to look for an aortic dissection because you can kind of see that false lumen that's created. And um, so it presents as a really severe and sudden tearing chest pain. So patients will say the pain radiates all the way to their back. And depending on which arterial branch it affects can depend on the presentation. So this patient had um, leg pain and foot numbness, so affected the arteries that are supplying the legs, which makes sense. Um, and then as we touched on earlier, when you have different blood pressures in your arms, um, it might be a sign of aortic dissection because it shows that there's kind of different output going to each arm so there might be a tear somewhere along the way um because otherwise you shouldn't have unequal blood pressure and pulses in each arm um other way to investigate it is looking at an ecg to see if there's any um changes towards the supply of the heart um a chest x-ray looking for a widened mediastinum um which again will show you the dissection of the aorta um Contrast CT is your most definitive way to see the flap, or you can even use a toe. So, so a transesophageal echocardiogram um, if the patient is too unstable for a CT. Um, so yeah, if it blocks other main arterial branches, you can get things like coronary occlusion and resulting in kind of heart, heart pathology. So looking at an ECG for changes. 
might get some neurological abnormalities, disappearances of peripheral pulses, and mesenteric ischemia, so changes to your gut and pain in the stomach as well. Or might affect your kidney function, so you might become anuric, so you stop producing urine output. Um, and the way to define aortic section is like type A and type B. So that just refers to the location of the tear. So in type A, you have um, a tear in your ascending aorta or arch. And this is the most common type. Two thirds of cases are type A. And the risk is your dissection extends back across your aortic root and can result in um, cardiac tamponade and aortic incompetence. And then you've got type B, which is your descending aorta. Um, so it's distal to your where your left subclavian originates from. So that is your kind of type A, type B. It's really important to remember. A is for ascending. That's how I remember it. And depending on the type of aortic dissection uh, influences the way in which you manage it. So if it's type A, um, you can use surgical management. So you want to control the blood pressure. So keeping it low, 100 to 120, just to prevent kind of bleeding. Um, but you can introduce a prosthetic tube graft to prevent further tearing and dissection. So you can do it through an open approach or an endovascular repair approach. And then with the type B, you tend not to do surgery unless it's complicated. So for example, it's a, there's a rupture or there's a perfusion issue. So typically what we do is give IV antihypertensives like labetalol, a little bit stronger, and these patients will be in ITU and we kind of reduce their systolic blood pressure um, a bit more aggressively to prevent the progression of the dissection. So pretty much everything you need to know about aortic dissections. Um, and then talking about uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, so AAA, um, a true aneurysm involves all layers of the vessel. So that's a classic MCQ question is how can you define a true aneurysm versus a pseudo aneurysm? And risk factors are age, um, males versus females. Males are more likely to get AAA, which is why they're screened. Hypertension, smoking, diabetes, family history, all your typical vascular risk factors. And then um, Marfan's disease as well. So connective tissue disease um, makes you more likely, which makes sense because then your uh, the connective tissue in your um, aorta wall is more likely to dilate and stretch. Um, it's usually asymptomatic, which is why they started screening people, because often people don't seek help if they have an aneurysm because they don't know it's there until it's too late, which is basically when it ruptures and you get pain in your abdomen and in your back and you become hemodynamically unstable. So the screening program is another MCQ question favourite. So always remember um this is in 75 year olds in males and it's done once and if they find a small aneurysm um then if it's less than three centimeters there's no action and you don't need to be screened again if it's between three to 4.4 it's considered small um, and you'd be screened yearly to monitor growth um if it's medium so 4.5 to 5.4 then it's three monthly screening um and if it's large, so it's over 5.5 centimetres, then you need an urgent referral within two weeks. And also if it's rapidly growing, so for example, it's growing more than a centimetre in a year, then that would also warrant a rapid referral. Great, so yeah, ultrasound is our main modality to image aortic aneurysms. Um, you can also use CT angiograms and MRI angiograms, and not to diagnose, but to help plan any operations. And you'd repair if it's large, basically, or it's rapidly growing or it's symptomatic. So you can either use an endovascular approach. So you pass a graft through the femoral vessel into the aorta and that helps kind of line the aorta. Or you can suture a graft in through an open approach. So the, these are ways to kind of protect the aneurysm from bursting. Um, so blood flows along the graft rather than fills into the aneurysm. Then what do we do if it's ruptured? So unfortunately, because of how severely hemodynamically unstable they get, there is a 50% mortality in these patients before they even reach hospital. Um, so they're very hypertensive, they're in a lot of shock. You want to avoid aggressive fluid replacement, which is what 
is intuitive when someone has kind of hypertension and low blood pressure, but you want to avoid pushing the blood pressure up too far because it would result in further bleeding. So you want to aim for a systolic of 90 uh, millimeters of mercury. And then management is emergency surgery to try and reline the aorta, fix the rupture. Um, so that comes to the end of the talk. So before we wrap up and finish, I just wanted to talk about um, tips for the OSCE and how to um, tackle the arterial and venous exams. Um, to be honest, they're both quite straightforward exams. I think a lot of um, people get worried about these exams because they don't practice them that often, when in reality, they're actually two very short and relatively straightforward exams. So with an arterial exam, just think about the location of your arteries. So where are the landmarks where you can feel the arteries? And that will help you just guide you through um, top to tail back to different arteries. So basically just can inspecting for signs of arterial disease, palpate, um, so temperature tells you perfusion if it's warm and well perfused, your cat refill time and sensation because when you have poor blood supply you start to lose some of that neurological sensation. Um, and then just work through your pulses from top to toe, so radial pulse, brachial pulse, um, carotid, and then your aorta, femoral, popliteal behind your knees, dorsalis pedis, and your posterior tibial. So these last two are the hardest to feel for, um, just because they're so distal, um, and the position's a bit trickier, so just included diagrams to help you find it. But if you ask the patient to point their big toe to the sky, and then you can find the dorsalis pedis quite easily, kind of next to the ligament. Um, and then posterior tibial is just um, under kind of your um, kind of medial malleolus. So just a little bit under and more posteriorly. And then have a listen. So see if you auscultate the aorta and the renal artery. So a couple of centimetres either side of the midline and in the groin and the femoral artery to look for any breweries. Um, and then to complete, you want to do a full cardiovascular exam, um, full neurological exam in the lower limb. And then you can also ask about glorification distance, do an ABPI and think about imaging. And then there's a few special tests you can do. So there's Berger's angle. So when the patient's lying supine, you can raise their legs straight and the ang you raise it slowly and the angle in which it becomes white is the angle in which it loses its blood supply. So the smaller the angle, the greater the arterial disease. Um, so you don't have to lift it by much and it's already lost its blood supply, which shows um, severe arterial disease. And the Berger's test, um, so moving on from finding the angle, after you've found the angle, you swing the leg off the bed, um, so they're sat up and you hang it down. And this test is positive if you get that reactive hyperemia, so that um, the leg becomes purple, red, and painful. So this is also just a sign of arterial disease and call it Burgess test positive. Um, so yeah, it's really quite straightforward with arterial exams. You just want to feel generally, are they warm and well perfused? Feel all the pulses, listen for any breweries. And when you're inspecting, look for signs for arterial disease. So look at the colour, is it pale? Is it mottled? Is there any tissue loss and gangrene? Are there any ulcers? Um, and is there any hair loss and shiny skin, which is a sign of peripheral arterial disease? Great. And then the last part is um, the venous exam. Again, also quite a straightforward exam. So looking for signs of chronic venous disease. So um, lipodermatosclerosis, the urine inverted champagne bottle, venous eczema, venous ulcers in the gator region, edema, varicose veins, all those things we've talked about so far today. And then you just want to have a look and inspect and then palpate along the course of the veins. So I've included a picture just to help. But you want to feel along the long saphenous veins, so it runs up the medial aspect of your leg to join the femoral vein at the saphenofemoral junction. And then you've got your short saphenous vein, which runs posteriorly behind the lateral malleolus and joins the popliteal vein. So it runs kind of the back of your calf. And then your saphenofemoral junction is um, 
just below and lateral to your pubic tubercle um, and you might get a saphina varix there so again feeling for at the SFJ um, and then asking the patient to cough there might be a cough impulse if they do have a swelling there. Um, you can also percuss so if you feel the SFJ and tap on the long saphenous vein at the knee um, if there is a distended varicose vein it will transmit and give a palpable impulse at your SFJ. Um, and you can also auscultate any clusters of veins. This might sound like a machinery murmur. You might get some murmurs if there's, for example, an arterial venous fistula. Then the special tests you can offer if the patients have obvious varicose veins, um, but it's unlikely you actually do them in an OSCE because they can be quite uncomfortable for patients. Um, so first of all, you've got your Trendelenburg test. So you lie the patient down and then you really raise their legs straight to 45 degrees. And then you can massage the veins to try empty them. And then you apply pressure on your saphenofemoral junction and ask the patient to stand. And then if the varicose veins immediately re refill, that means your valve incompetence is below the SFJ. But if they only refill after you release the pressure from the SFJ. This means your valve incompetence is at the level of the SFJ and that's a positive test. So tourniquet test is really similar um, but what you do is you apply a tourniquet to your proximal thigh um, and then ask the patient to stand if they refill with the tourniquet on it means the valve incompetence is below the level of the tourniquet and then you can keep applying the tourniquet more and more distally lower down until the veins don't rapidly refill and then you can find your level of valve incompetence that way. And then to complete your venous exam, think about other things you might want to know about the patient. So doing an ABPI or an arterial exam, look for a contraindication to compressor stockings. You also think about some imaging like venous duplex and a Doppler ultrasound. So that concludes um, the, this vascular surgery talk. I hope you guys have found it useful. I know we've covered a lot in the past hour, but hopefully it was um, relevant to your upcoming exams and try to talk through a few cases and that will help you approach your MCQs not thinking just about vascular pathology but other things that we talked about today like neurological pathologies and orthopedic pathologies because um, it's really important to cast a wide differential in an MC when approaching an MCQ. So I'd really appreciate if you could um, scan this QR code and give some feedback. I will also try to put um, the feedback form link in the chat for those of you who are struggling with the QR code. Um, this talk is part of our final year series and we've done a whole host of talks covering all the essential topics for medicine and surgery for final years. And um, we've got our next talk will be this Thursday. They tend to be Monday and Thursdays at 7 p.m. and just register through med or as usual. And there'll be a talk on psychiatry on Thursday. As always, if you've got any questions, please feel free to email um, finalyear at mindthebleep.com and I can pick up your um, emails and answer any questions that you might have. But otherwise, I hope you guys have enjoyed the talk. And um, yes, this, well, this was recorded. I'll upload it to Medal afterwards and hopefully to YouTube and um, once we've figured out the technical difficulties. But yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I'm glad um, you found it useful. Um, good. I will leave it there. Thank you very much, everyone.